Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's a great pleasure to rise today in this House to debate this Opposition Day motion. And as luck would have it, uh, when it's a Bloc Québécois or an NDP Opposition Day motion, the Conservative Party gets remarkably few speaking slots. So this is only our second speaking slot today on this motion. And, and as luck would have it, I get a full 20 minutes. And Madam Speaker, I have a lot to say. And I think uh, colleagues may regret uh, allowing me to have the floor for the full 20 minutes, but uh, I do in fact have a lot to say on this, uh, this motion uh, at hand. Now, I think it's a happy coincidence, a happy convergence that today's debate is what we call an opposition day or a supply day debate. Often if you look at the Chiron under the screen, it says business of supply. It says it right now on the Chiron below. Business of supply, which is somewhat an antiquated way of speaking, and I believe most Canadians probably don't understand what supply may mean in the context, context of Parliament, but supply means money. Supply means granting the government the ability to spend money. And in our Canadian context, in our Canadian parliamentary context, each opposition party has the opportunity to raise debates during business of supply, during opposition day motions, before we in December grant the government the cold hard cash. Before December 10th, we have the opportunity to debate things. It's like the airing of grievances. We as opposition parties get the chance to air our grievances in this House. Now, Madam Speaker, why I say this is a happy convergence and a happy coincidence, because the ancient roots of the business of the supply rest with a monarchy. And so here today we have a fun coincidence where we can talk both about the cold hard cash, about the business of supply, and also about the monarchical roots of this process. I would like to draw the House's attention the concept of grievance before supply and its ancient roots. And I want to quote from the eminent scholar C.E.S. Franks, Ned Franks, formerly late of the Queen's University in Kingston. Franks writes, Parliament demanded and obtained the right to set its own agenda and it placed the expressions of grievance before the King's business. Only in this way could the Commons be assured of a sympathetic and attentive ear. Grievance before supply became one of the key principles of parliamentary government. The Commons also insisted that it could discuss the King's business as long as, in such a matter, as, long as and in such a matter as it wished. From this comes the principle that the House is alone responsible for its own proceedings and its own rules and procedures. These are not the King's business, but the Commons's. And so, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the question of supply, the questions of what we ought to speak of, here we are debating the monarchy. Now, Madam Speaker, I'm very proud to be part of an opposition party with a leader who believes in putting the people first. Their families, their homes, their paychecks, their country. Yes. And so then when it comes to a, a motion before this, and I want to read at least the preamble to this motion. Part one, Canada is a democratic state. Correct. This House believes in the principle of equality for all. Again, agreed, Madam Speaker. But let's talk about economic equality and where we are right now in this country, where families are struggling to make ends meet, where families are having a challenge to put food on the table. I have an email that I received from a senior citizen from near Arthur, Ontario. Arthur, of course, being Canada's most patriotic village. But she wrote this, quote, Balancing a budget was incredibly difficult before COVID, but now it is beyond me. Speaking for myself, basic essential groceries absorb at least half of my income. But here we are debating the monarchy. We're debating something that the bloc knows full well will not change. It's unable to change based on our constitutional system. But that's the issue that seems fit. Not the families in Perth Wellington, not the families who are struggling right now across the country, not the families who each and every day are sitting down at the kitchen table, often late at night or early in the morning, going through their numbers and wondering how they're going to make the ends meet, how they're going to make sure that the end of the month doesn't come before they have enough paycheck pay 
to make those final bills. And Madam Speaker, I want to talk very briefly about Perth Wellington. Perth Wellington is one of the great agricultural uh, places in the country. Uh, we, we are very proud of our agricultural heritage. And one of the things that we could be talking about right now is the impact that this Liberal government is having on Canadian farm families, having on the challenges they're facing them, whether it be the carbon tax. The carbon tax is driving up the costs on Canadian farmers. This is a business of supply. This is an opposition day motion that is just ripe for the taking, Madam Speaker. We could be talking about how farm families in Perth, Wellington, or in any of the Quebec ridings are being impacted by the government's mishandling, or the government's mishandling of the tariff issue on fertilizer. Now, Madam Speaker, no one in this House will disagree that we need to take strong action against Vladimir Putin and his thugs. No one is disagreeing with that. But when the government slapped a tariff on fertilizer, for fertilizer that was purchased pre-March 2nd, it impacted no one except Canadian farmers. I, w I was, uh, uh, an individual came into my Harrison office recently and gave me a copy of his bill from one of the local farm supply stores. And the impact alone on fertilizer purchased March 2nd, prior to March 2nd, for a relatively small amount, was $1,376.20. $1,300 that's been taken out of our rural economy for no good purpose. No benefit whatsoever, no impact on the Russian regime, but yet taken out of the local economy. And I think if we're looking at what could be discussed in an Opposition Day motion when we're talking about the business of supply, I think colleagues in our party and most parties would see the impact of the housing crisis. The housing crisis that's preventing young families from moving into their first home, young university graduates from moving out of their parents' basement, or families looking for a place to rent. The rental housing crisis is a challenge because they can no longer afford to actually buy a house. And I have a, an email from a local councillor in, in the town of St. Mary's, and, and she wrote this. There are little to no options. In our small town, I know of families with four kids that are in jeopardy of being homeless. Also a single dad with children. Young adults that cannot move away from their parents' home because there is simply nothing available to rent. Some families are being displaced because the owners of the homes they now rent want to sell them for profit in a hot market. These are the issues that are impacting Canadians. These are the issues that are impacting us every single day, the issues that we hear in our ridings across the country. But yet we're debating this. We're debating this issue for political means, for political and partisan means, rather than focusing on a number of the issues that are matter. Issues like the cost of internet and the availability of rural broadband. I see my friend from Dauphin Swan River, Nipawa, uh, in, in the House today. And one of his challenges now as our shadow minister for rural economic development and, and connectivity is the fact that here across Canada, there are massive amounts of our country that are in dead zones, that do not have access to reliable, high-speed internet. Even in my area of rural southern Ontario, we're not, we're, we're not that far in the great scheme of things from places like London, Kitchener, Guelph. We have massive areas of our community that cannot access rural high-speed internet. And those that can are paying through the nose. I've heard stories of families and farm businesses having to pay tens of thousands of dollars to get fiber down a quarter mile stretch of concession road. These are the types of issues that resonate with Canadians. These are the types of issues that each and every day we as Canadians are hearing about, that we want to focus on, that we were sent to this place to focus on. But again, Madam Speaker, here we are discussing this issue. One final point that I want to raise that I've, uh, two, actually two final points of issues I've, I've, I've been brought to my attention by my constituents that we should merit discussion is food insecurity. I have the great benefit to benefit from some amazing organizations in my riding that go above and beyond the call of duty in ensuring that families, the community members, the persons living with disabilities have food on their table each and every day. I think of the Stratford House of Blessing. I think of the local community food center. I think of the Salvation Army, all which go above and beyond the call of duty. But when I get emails like this, one critical challenge is food insecurity. 
The shocking reality is in Canada, one of the richest countries in the world, over 4.4 million people can't afford the food they need. In communities across Canada, one in eight households and one in six children are affected by food insecurity. And Madam Speaker, the fact of the matter is, with the rising cost of groceries, with the impact that inflation is having on groceries, these numbers are going to rise. These numbers are going to rise and have that impact on families, have that impact on folks in my riding and across the country that simply can no longer afford to put food on the table. Which leads me to my next and final email that I'm going to cite, cite and that's about the family doctor shortage. We all know that when people are food insecure, it causes other challenges in the healthcare system. And the fact of the matter is there are far too many Canadians living in Canada without access to a family doctor. And so I've received a number of emails bringing to my attention and urging me to act on the healthcare workforce issue, specifically on the inability for families to have that primary care physician, the individual that can help care for one's family and ensure that there are preventable uh, measures in place to prevent uh, urgent care in, 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 in an emergency department or other matters that prevent it from ever happening. And we all know, going back to food insecurity, that when someone is food insecure, it has an impact on their overall uh, impact their overall livelihood, their overall health. So, Madam Speaker, I raise these issues because that's where we are today. We are in this debate, we are in this House discussing the business of supply. And no debate is ever wasted when we can raise the issues that affect our constituents. But it is unfortunate that in this specific uh, example, we're not specifically debating and eventually voting on food insecurity, on rural broadband, on support for families, on support for cutting the cost of living, on support for ensuring that every Canadian has a family doctor. So to the issue at hand in this debate, and, and, and I promise I won't go on at too much length, but I do have some thoughts on this particular motion. Not the least of which is the error in the motion itself. The motion refers to the British monarchy. But as members will know, we pledge allegiance to the Crown in Canada. And if we reflect on what is said in the Green Book, what we refer to as the Green Book, Bosque and Gagnon, it says this about the oath of allegiance. And I would right add, Madam Speaker, let's be clear where this motion is coming from. This motion is coming from the Parti Québécois in Quebec. This motion is coming from the PQ cousins of the Bloc Québécois. And I should point out, Madam, Madam Speaker, that despite the efforts of the 32 Bloc Québécois MPs, they only helped to elect three PQ M ML MNA, uh, MNAs in Quebec. So I, I do question, frankly, the, uh, the motivation of, uh, of, of that. But when we take our seats, and this is all driven by the oath of allegiance that we all take when we are sworn in as parliamentarians. And this is what it says in Bosque and Gagnon. When members swear or solemnly affirm allegiance to the sovereign, they are also swearing or solemnly affirming allegiance to the institutions the sovereign represents, including the concept of democracy. Thus, members are making a pledge to conduct themselves in the best interests of the country. The oath or solemn affirmation reminds members of the serious obligations and responsibilities that they are assuming. Madam Speaker, that's what we are talking about. That's what we need to be focusing on, our duties as parliamentarians and our devotion to our country, our commitment to our country. That's what the oath of allegiance is talking about. That's what the oath of allegiance is focusing on. It's not focusing on the British monarchy. It's focusing on our duties as parliament, to parliamentarians. And frankly, I find it somewhat troubling when parliamentarians from a certain party keep referring to the British monarchy. In fact, if we go back as far back to 1947 and the classic Corey and Hodgetts text, Corey and Hodgetts write this. The British government and parliament no longer have any control over its members. The dominions are autonomous and independent. They are, bo they are bound to Britain and to other one another only by the invisible ties of a common tradition. 
we do have a common tradition with our British counterparts, but we also have a common tradition with the first French monarch from 1534 when Canada, what is now considered Canada, was in fact a French royal province. And so we do have a history that is reflected in this, in this place and in this concept. And I want to focus again, once, once again, on the concept of the crown and right of Canada, a distinct and separate entity from the British monarchy. And I would quote from Philippe Lagasse and James Bowden, who talk about the Canadian crown as a corporate soul. And I'll quote, however antiquated or abstract it may appear, it remains that the crown is the concept of the state in Canada and that the state is a legal person known as Her Majesty in Right of Canada by virtue of the crown's status as a non-statutory corporation sole. Claims that the laws governing this Canadian corporation fall under the authority of the British Parliament or that the legal personality of the Canadian state is still the same as the legal personality of the British state undermines the independence and sovereignty that Canada began to enjoy after 1926 and could fully claim after 1982. There we have it, Madam Speaker. The Canadian Crown, His Majesty in the Right of Canada, is a separate and distinct legal entity from that of the British monarchy. In fact, Madam Speaker, if we want to have a more lengthy conversation of where we go as a parliament and where other Commonwealth countries may go, they'll actually find that it is indeed possible that other countries, including the United Kingdom itself, could do away with their monarchy, but Canada itself, as its distinct corporation soul, the monarchy of Canada, the crown of Canada as a corporation soul, is a separate and independent institution beyond that of the British monarchy. Now, my friend from Chatham-Kent Leamington earlier referenced some of the benefits and some of the um, added uh, spe specificity of the Canadian Commonwealth tradition, the, com the parliamentary democracy that we have here in Canada. And one of the great scholars, Walter Badgett, talked about the beauty of a constitutional monarchy, talked about how it worked and how it has benefited not only the United Kingdom, but in our case, our tradition. And Badgett talks about both the efficient and the dignified parts. The dignified parts are the monarchy, the crown, the august nature of that part. The efficient part is out of the cabinet. And I see my time is down to two minutes, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you for that. The efficient part is that of the cabinet. Now, we may from time to time debate how efficient a particular cabinet or a particular government may be. But the important part is recognizing the distinction between the two. The benefit of a constitutional monarchy is that the embodiment of the crown, the embodiment, embodiment of the head of state, does not rest with the partisan deliberations of the day-to-day -day political struggles of the House of Commons or of other legislatures. That's the benefit, dividing the efficient and the dignified parts that allow us to have a head of state represented in Canada by Her Excellency the Governor-General, but having a separate and distinct political part, a separate and distinct efficient part that focuses on the day-to-day -day running. I know for a fact, Madam Speaker, that other countries where those two are merged, where the head of state and the head of government are one end of the same, is not ones that we would like to emulate. And Madam Speaker, in my time that run that's running out, I want to point out one final point, that Parliament consists of three parts. We often think of Parliament as two houses, which is correct, but it is three parts. It is the House of Commons, it is the Senate and it is the Crown. Those are the three parts of Parliament and those are the three processes through which bills become law through first reading, second reading, third reading in both houses and finally royal assent. And those three elements were combined once 
together of a speech from the throne in 1957 when Her Late Majesty the Queen delivered the speech from the throne from the Senate chamber during her visit to Canada in 1957. So, Madam Speaker, I know my time is out, but I thank you for your indulgence. Questions et commentaires. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for saint hyacinthe Baggett. Madam Speaker, there's something that I would like to understand. In our colleague's speech, while well, we've been hearing the same message since this morning, he said that there are so many more important things to talk about, etc., etc. So I, I understood that criticism this morning, but in fact, at the end of the day, people aren't really putting forth arguments of substance against our position. But I also remember when the Conservative government was proud of putting the Queen's face everywhere. So why is it that this is happening now? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to thank the member for St. Yassant Baggett for his question. I think I did talk about the monarchy in Canada, and I talked about the two parts in Canada, the cabinet and the monarchy. And I am very proud to be a conservative and who sees the importance of our traditions like the monarchy and the um, Queen Elizabeth and now uh, King Charles. I think that in this house we have heard negative things about the monarchy in past kings. And I think it's important because uh, we have indigenous peoples and there's the importance of reconciliation with those First Nations, uh, with indigenous peoples. Much, Madam Speaker. Wow, it's always nice to uh, hear people and see people come in here carrying the receipts. Uh, for the member from the uh, Bloc Quebecois who just made the comment that this member wasn't actually addressing the motion, he should really review the Hansard and the second half of his speech. He literally shut down every argument for this motion. It's incredible, Madam Speaker. Sometimes the stars align perfectly, and I am uh, in perfect sync with uh, uh, Conservative members and their position on things, and this certainly is one of those times. I'm wondering if the member can reflect on why he thinks it is, and I know he hinted at it earlier in his speech with the um, motive of this being to be in line with the uh, provincial uh, party, but why would the Bloc Québécois waste an entire supply day when they only get three a year? Why would they waste it on this? You know, what's their motive behind this, in his opinion? The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And it is an odd day where, uh, where I agree entirely with the member from Kingston and the Islands, but he, he's absolutely right. Uh, when, when there are so few opportunities to air grievances in this place, when we have so many issues affecting our constituents, our, our, our ridings, our, our, the people across the country, to see this debate going on on this angle rather than on the cost of living, it, it, it's truly unfortunate. But I think we do know uh, the impetus. We do know the motivation. And it's unfortunately trying to bring a provincial uh, legislative debate into this, uh, this House of Commons. I, I think if if we were to survey Canadians from coast to coast to coast, I think their number one issue would be the cost of living, probably followed closely by the cost of housing. And those are the issues I think we as Canadians need to be focusing on. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And comments, the Honourable Member for Nunavut. To you, uh, I agree very much uh, with both uh, the Conservatives and the Liberals that uh, the arguments have been made not to have this motion go forward. Uh, I also really appreciated the Member of Parliament for Perth Wellington for indicating all the social indicators uh, that we could have discussed and tried to address uh, in this motion. I wonder if the member agrees that maybe the party could have done better to advocate for its indigenous communities. For example, we don't hear very much about the 14 Inuit communities in Nunavik, and maybe the party could have done better to make sure that the Northern Quebec Inuit could have been better represented by this party. The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. 
Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank the member from, from Nunavut uh, for, for her question. And, and, and it's an exceptionally important question. There are so many things that we could be focusing on. And she mentioned the, uh, the, the 14 uh, Indigenous communities in northern Quebec, and I'm sure there are issues that are affecting her communities in, in Nunavut as well. I mean, thank, frankly, Madam Speaker, if we want to talk across the country, the fact that there are still Indigenous communities across this country without clean drinking water is a crying shame. And we as yep. Canadians should be incredibly disappointed in ourselves, in, 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 in the government, in, in all sides of things, that that's still happening. In a country as, as rich as Canada, in a country as bountiful as Canada, the fact that communities do not have clean drinking water is a crying shame and it's completely unacceptable. Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for his speech, and it's a shame that, uh, that it would seem to be required that, that he would need to deliver such an eloquent education on some of the basics of the Constitution of, of Canada, including the uh, uh, the Canadian uh, monarchy, and, and uh, the, I'm glad that he did so, and that he had a chance to wax uh, Walter Badgett. And uh, I, I think that I felt that he didn't quite get to the end of, of, of where he wanted to go uh, with that part of his speech, and so I, I give him uh, a few moments to uh, to expand on um, on, on any point that that uh, might have been lacking or for, for lack of time. For Wellington. Well, Madam Speaker, you know, always off the, you know, the phrase, be careful what you wish for, because it might actually happen. And, and so the, the member from Calgary Rocky Ridge does, does raise Walter Badgett, and I think that all Canadians would, would be well served to read about the traditions of our parliamentary system. I think that too often this place, this house, is often seen as a museum. But this is an active place of discussion. This is an active place of debate. And I think if we look at our traditions, our Canadian traditions and where they came from, we should never see this place as a museum to democracy. That this place ought to be an active debating chamber, an active place to debate the issues of the day. And when we talk about de de defining and, and differentiating those two parts, as Badgett talks about, that's one of the points I want to focus on and make sure we raise all the time, that this place will never be a museum to democracy. Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it really is a pleasure to put a question to the Honourable Member for Perth Wellington, who is, as ever, uh, knowledgeable and thoughtful in putting forward his views. Uh, I am very grateful to him for stressing that when we take our oath as members of Parliament to um, His Majesty, we are taking an oath to Canada, not to any one person, and not to, as in the past, I took my oath to Her Majesty the Queen. I wasn't paying, uh, uh, making a, an oath to one individual, but to Canada, and that oath is important. I also think it was, it was very helpful to canvas what it would mean if we changed our system of government, which is what this proposes. Uh, briefly, I'll say I grew up in the United States, and I watched what I think is human nature to elevate even elected people to sort of royal status, to venerate not just the elected president, but um, his, and it has always been to this point of pronoun his, uh, wife as a first lady, even to the whole family, e even to their royal dogs. Uh, I would like to ask the honorable member if he wouldn't agree that human nature is better served by having a monarchy which is ceremonial than venerating uh, average human beings who are elected. Honourable Member for Perth Wellington in 20 seconds. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And in 20 seconds, you know, there is that ceremonial element of the monarchy which allows it to be separate and apart from the political day-to-day -day hustlings that we see within this place and across the country. I think it's important that we have that distinction between the head of state and the head of government that allows the political actors to do their job while remaining a dignified part in the monarchy in the and represented here in Canada by the Governor-General. Thank you, Madam Speaker.